love going to Broadway shows, but can't go now because Broadway's closed. Join tour guide Tim and Belasco too as they bring Broadway history to you. Grab your Broadway passport for what's in store on your virtual Broadway tour. The Chanin Brothers, Henry and Irwin, continued their theatrical expansion on 47th Street with this week's theater, The Brooks Atkinson. It was originally the Mansfield when it opened on February 15, 1926, named for noted 19th century actor Richard Mansfield. Very few theater goers are familiar with Mansfield today, but in his time he was known as one of the greatest actors in the world, consistently performing both on Broadway and the West End in London. But it was his most famous role as the title character of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in London that garnered the most attention for all the wrong reasons. Prior to 1900, negative stigma surrounded anyone involved in the acting profession. No one in the general public was quite sure just how actors achieved their performative illusions. Such was the case when one theater goer wrote into the police after attending a performance of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that the murderer that was loose in the streets of London, Jack the Ripper, must be Mansfield. How else could an actor play a murderer so convincingly on stage if he wasn't actually one? Mansfield was brought in for questioning, but was eventually let go with many alibis. Thankfully for us actors, and for Mansfield, that negative stigma eventually dissolved. <laughs> After a hit and miss handful of decades and 10 years as a television studio, the theater's name was eventually changed to the Brooks Atkinson in 1960, named for the respected New York Times theater critic. Atkinson was known for a supportive, positive outlook and very often provided criticism that producers would use to enhance their productions. His sunny disposition seemed to buoy his new namesake theater's productions as well. Shortly after the renaming, Neil Simon made his Broadway debut with his hit comedy, Come Blow Your Horn. This was followed by Same Time Next Year, which settled in for a three-year run, as well as the hysterical backstage comedy of Michael Frayn's Noises Off. And as an actor, well, critics aren't known to be our favorite people in our industry, I do love the tradition that surrounds these powerful pens showing up just before a show opens and the anticipation of reading the reviews at an opening night party. Personally, I just wish the days of opening night parties being held at Sardi's with producers reading those reviews atop a table weren't a thing of the past. Now it's reviews being read on cell phones at the Copacabana which isn't nearly as exciting. The audition process for a Broadway show has remained relatively the same for the last 100 years. The only main difference now is that auditions take place in rehearsal studios, unlike the olden days where a lot of auditions took place in a Broadway theater on stage. But in 2007, a revival of Grease at the Brooks Atkinson opted for a different route to cast their two leading players, a reality show. You're the one that I want, utilizing the hit song from the movie Grease as its catchy title, pitted Danny Zuko's and Sandy Dombrowski's against each other in weekly episodes. And while this was the first time a reality show would be utilized for casting on Broadway, Andrew Lloyd Webber had already done this with uh, his 2006 West End revival of The Sound of Music, calling it, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Week after week, the contestants competed by demonstrating their different singing, acting, and dancing prowess until the final audience vote was tallied. It was finally announced that the new Danny and Sandy would be Max Crum and Laura Osnes, who have both enjoyed wonderful careers post Greece. Just one year later, midway through its Broadway run, Legally Blonde opted for a similar approach with MTV's The Search for Elle Woods. My, how far we've come from the opening audition sequence in a chorus line. After spending years as a medium-sized theater with a hit-and-miss track record, the last four years have proved very lucrative for the Brooks Atkinson. 
In 2016, the musical Waitress moved into the theater. Based on the 2007 movie of the same name, the show made Broadway history as the first all-female creative team with musical lyrics written by Sarah Bareilles, direction by Diane Paulus, choreography by Lauren Lataro, and book by Jesse Nelson. The last time there was a female-led creative team was 1978's Runaways, and that was because its creator, Elizabeth Swados, did everything. The story of female empowerment in Waitress resonated with audiences' hearts for nearly four years, but one quirky twisted intermission resonated with their nostrils as well. A working oven was placed in the lobby of the Brooks Atkinson. Throughout the first act, a pie with extra sugar and spice was baked so that when the doors opened for intermission, the smell wafted in. The aroma was the perfect salivating factor to increase sales of the pies they had at the merchandise stand and set the perfect tone for all that was baked into act two of the performance. The last time I heard about scents being included in a show budget was for Elf the Musical. They filled it with air fresheners so it smelled like pine trees, hoping the audience would associate it with Christmas. Personally, uh, I'll take the smell of a bakery over a forest any day. Hello! Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. Can you believe it? Here we are again. Merry Christmas. If you celebrate, that's the thing you do in your life. I hope you had a great Christmas. We are here again in front of my 1910 brick wall with another Saturday, which means our virtual Broadway tour journey is continuing. Uh, for those who don't know who I am or what we're doing and just happen to find us on live, my name is Tim Dolan, welcome. As part of our virtual Broadway tour series, every week we're coming to you live with someone who has worked at the theater we're featuring that week. And this week we are joined by the incredible, the funny, the hilarious, the very nice, and talented, and we'll talk about it all. Stephanie Torrens from Waitress at the Brooks Atkinson Theater. Um, for if you really don't know who I am or Broadway Up Close, uh, what Broadway Up Close is, uh, I'm an actor named Tim Dolan, you're welcome. Uh, we I own a company called Broadway Up Close in New York City where we do tours of the theater district, history, ghost stories, all the things you didn't know, you didn't know that you really wanna know about our 41 Broadway theaters. I have an entire team that I call my green team that are actors and stage managers that are your windows and your eyes to our insane theatrical lives. Um, we have five exterior tours that we've been doing since 2010. In October, I was uh, so proud pre-COVID to open our first interior tour, which takes you inside Broadway's oldest theater, which is the Hudson. And then I opened a gift shop about a year and a half ago because I thought, well, my life's not insane enough. I'll open a brick and mortar gift shop. And so we have a gift shop in the middle of Times Square, currently stationed in front of Lion King with a six foot tall Broadway sign of marquee letters uh, and 150 light bulbs. All of that uh, gift shop uh, closed because of this thing you've heard of called the global pandemic. But we do have uh, in-person tours, masks, socially distanced, hand warmers. I'm ready for you should you find yourself in New York City in the middle of a global pandemic with nothing to do. I'm ready for you. Information on all of that, www.broadwayupclose.com. Um, you should check out that uh, after the tour when or after today when we're done talking to uh, Stephanie. I never envisioned a world uh, without Broadway. To me, if New York City is still afloat, then Broadway is open. The two things are inherently linked, I thought, but um, apparently that's not the case. So when this all started, March 12th, 2020, uh, I thought, okay, it'll be a couple of weeks and then oh, a couple of months, sure, we'll figure it out. And then now here we are like 37 years later uh, being like Broadway. Remember when that was a thing? So I thought, well, maybe I'll bring some of our stories online. We'll offer them free because people like free things. And so I've been coming to you with one video every single day of my life for the last 28 weeks, uh, 41 weeks total, uh, 41 Broadway theaters. We started with the oldest and we moved forward in time chronologically, which brings us this week to week 28, the 28th oldest theater, the Brooks Atkinson. I hope you've enjoyed all the history, fun facts, uh, air freshener and Jack the Ripper info this week. How's today gonna work? For today, we're gonna learn all about Stephanie's theatrical journey, her time working on Waitress. If you have any questions for her or me along the way, drop them in the comments. And if you haven't already, for those who are joining us live, I see some of you have, which makes me smile. Um, drop and let me know where you're watching from today so we can see where our stories are going this Saturday noon on Broadway. And so, as you're all like tuckered out from Christmas, join me and without further ado, join me in welcoming Broadway's Stephanie Torns. <sighs> Dreams do come true. <laughs> Honestly, Ladies and gentlemen. I feel like I need you to just inter like introduce me every day I wake up and I'm like, am I the cool Every one? morning <laughs> or just every audition. You're like, uh, they're like, just do 16 bars. But oh, uh, Tim's here to. Exactly. I'm like, hold, please. 
<laughs> Hold on. Uh, let me, my MC's uh, just running a couple minutes late, but he'll be here momentarily. He, I don't enter a room without him. Uh, yeah, if, if only. Um, hi, how are you? Where are you? Um, right, well, you know, staying in, I got, um, staying in because, you know, it's a, it's a yeah. weird time and, uh, you yeah. know, and unfortunately I get to see my family this year, but next year is going to be the most epic one, I keep saying, and um, yeah. I everyone happy and healthy then you know anything. yeah yeah that's what it is um yeah good i love that um for those who don't know let's go back back to the very beginning yeah will you tell us uh where you grew up will you tell us when you first um got exposed to theater and theater was like a thing you were like oh i kind of like that and then maybe when that transitions to like oh i think i want to do that get us all the way like mini bio version of stephanie torrens's life pre like the moment you step foot in new york city and then we'll go from there yeah um well i am born and raised new yorker so um long island is where i grew up yeah <laughs> okay and so um for me coming in and seeing broadway shows was such a norm I always loved them. And that was just something that um, we always came in as kids and did. Um, yeah. First Broadway show you ever saw? Footloose. Really? Richard Rogers? Sure. All right. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I loved it, of course. And um, I grew up dancing, though. So, like, you know the show, like, Dance Moms? Duh. That's what I did, except it wasn't, like, as I didn't have someone crazy yelling at me like that. Um, <laughs> Great. So I grew up doing that. So like, I really loved coming and seeing shows, always loved them, singing around the house, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I never, no one in my family is in the arts. So it's just, you know, something I enjoyed and never really thought about actually doing. Right. Um, so not uh, not an arts inclined family, but it just because your, your proximity to Broadway, it's like, well, this is what people do. We'll go see shows, even though none of your family was arts inclined. Yeah, yeah. And they also knew that I just loved that kind of stuff. So sure. We're like, well, let's do it, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we did that. And then um, when I was in high school, I played a lot of sports growing up. So when I was in high school, they needed dancers for the musical. And, of course, oh. I'm not doing a musical. <laughs> and and uh, they, they, they roped me in, and it was Oklahoma. I got to just, you know, live my best dreams and danced and had the best time ever. So the following year... For the musical, I did not do the sport, and I auditioned for the musical and like fell in love. Um, but still, one then all of a sudden, okay, college time. Ooh, what am I going to do with my life? Right? You're like, so right. this choice about what you're doing. And so I knew I wanted to keep music in, so I decided that I would go to school to be a music teacher, to teach like chorus and things. Um, so I originally went to school up at SUNY Fredonia, which is okay. up in New York, and um, I lasted about. <laughs> Half of the freshman year. 20 minutes, and you were yeah. like, <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. and so it was during that break, you get like two months off when you're like in college, right? Yeah, or whatever. So during that break, I had some friends from upstate who'd never seen a Broadway show, so they came down to visit, and we went in and we saw Phantom of the Opera. And for me, that was like the 600th time I've seen that show, and, sure. I, and I loved it, and so. We were sitting there watching this show, and it was when they started doing their bows that I just all of a sudden started ugly crying and full on had that moment of, I want to do that. This is what I want to do. Ugh. Never did that in my life, like ever. And so I, over dinner, told my parents, I was like, so um, I have something I'd like to say. And of course, like just panic, just like, what's happening? Um, <laughs> And thankfully, they are really awesome and supportive. So they said, okay. And so I left SUNY Fredonia. And, and I, you're, so this is, you're still like 18, 19. Yeah. Okay. So I took some time off, just like went to like, uh, like a local college just to get yeah, like, community college or something. Yeah. yeah sure. Um, then the fall, when the fall came back around, I went uh, to AMDA, the American Musical Dramatic Academy. Yeah. And did that, and that's a two year program. And I knew that this is at this point what I wanted to do. So I went straight through. So you can yeah. do that. Um, and yeah, and that was. And what year was that? 
That what was, year? So like you would have graduated AMDA 2000 and what? Like I'm trying to figure out how difference in age we are. I can't remember. I, I graduated 2008, but because it's a two-year program, it's a little funky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I was at AMDA, five, I graduated 2004. Yeah. 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 Boom. Okay. And so AMDA, you, okay, so you're like, you have this, you know what you want. You know, you're, you're working towards those bows. You know what you don't want to do because you've, you've dabbled in, in this other, these other worlds. And so you hit AMDA and you're like taking the world by storm. I know exactly what I want. Just tell me the tools I need to get there. And then 2008, I'm going to storm the world. Is that essentially it? Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. And it's crazy because it was interesting to see how when you're grouped into the groups, you know, there was some people in my group who were at fresh out of high school. So this was their first thing. And so yeah. like, the mindset for me was such different because I did that aspect already, you know? Yeah. Um, I was just so like, <laughs> yeah, you're like, you have your whole, I call those horse blinders. Exactly. You have your blinders on and you're like, I'm, I'm, you're in your lane and you're, it, it, it's going to end well, usually because that right. laser focus usually has great results. Okay. So then you graduate AMDA, your blinders are off because now you're at an audition in Laducas. And what, what are the first like moments where you go, is it like you go to your first audition, you book it, or what's the first moment where you're like, oh, I'm not untalented. There is a world where maybe someone will pay me money to do this thing and maybe this will work out. Yeah. I mean, I was very lucky. I got an agency right away. So yeah. I felt like, oh, okay. Right. And the agency people are going to push for me. Right. They Wait, who was your first agent or is maybe still same agent? No, I know. Um, <laughs> I think I know this. Is it that were they on the Upper East Side, Sixty First Street? Yeah. I think we had both had the same first agent. I don't know I, why I know this. The be, like the best memory. I'm over here, like. Um, Paulina um, Eisen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh! And I haven't thought about this name honestly in, uh, I, in I, a I, long time. Been here for a long time because I knew it was like. Like fancy sounding, but yeah, I forget that that. Oh, until you said that, I was like, wait, I think I actually know this. We had the same first agent. We are both no longer with them. I love them so much. Here we are, global pandemic. Okay, great. Um, okay, so you get an agent, and you're like, okay, yeah. you're gonna and, kill this. Yeah, like people see me as like I could do this. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, so I went on just a bunch of auditions, like you know, start off, start off auditions that like felt normal, right? And then I'll never forget. I had my first Wicked audition, and that was Elphaba was my dream role. So sure. audition, it was just a general at Telsey. So um, and so I remember just being like, oh, what, what, and just totally shocked. And either way, I just knew I wanted to go in and just have fun and have a good time because in my head I was like, there's no way, this is like I'm way too young. This is yeah. not in the books yet, but how exciting. So I went in, had a great time, and then, you know, time, a little time passed, and then finally sure. I got an audition, and it was actually not a general, it was like appointment time, yeah. this happening, we need someone for like, you know, future replacements, and I just remember being like, how is this happening? Crazy. Um, yeah, so I went in five times over the course of like, I would say a year. Towards the okay. end, it started to speed up where that was like, where I was like, oh, this is legit. Like they are looking. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And I just, I'll never forget. I was doing children's theater on the Upper West Side. And like, as you do, pull, like putting up the set, taking it down every show, right? Like 10 a.m. jump roping and singing for children. <laughs> and I remember that feeling of like the last time and I'll never forget there was this um, one of my still to this day, a good friend of mine, he turned to me and he was like, you're never going to touch a set again. <laughs> so this is you, you booked Alphaba is, is the, is the story. Before I booked the understudy for Alphaba and I had to be there in like two, two and a half weeks. Come on. And you were like sets. Never. Right. Uh, green makeup, sure. Right. I was so young that I like you don't get taught those things, right? No, oh, right. Like, what do you mean I can't touch a set? So, like, no idea yet that like yeah. I'm 
the whole union thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a fantastic group of people that get paid to do those things. Yes, and they did get paid well. Maybe not right now, uh, but in general, yes. The, okay, so this is like, okay, we have to rewind a minute because we talked about your training where you're like, dance moms, I dance a lot, this is great. But now suddenly, and you're like, but then you see Phantom of the Opera and you're like, which is not a dance show really. And then you're like, I wanna do that. And now you're like, I wanna be Elphaba and I'm gonna sing high Fs and F sharps on a, on a cherry picker and it happens. So where does that, like you just, you're like one of these children that like woke up and were like, I can do all the things. Yes. Legit, like, but didn't know. Like I didn't right. know that was, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, it's just something that just automatically just, I came out of the womb, like. Yeah, and you were just like, let's go, yes. Uh, yeah. And so then in Wicked, covering Alphaba, so one, let's talk about the first time you are on, well, let's talk about the first time you're, they green you, uh, uh, they put on your green before you, uh, you're put in or whatever. So what was the first time like being green since this week is so much green and my life is green? Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was, yeah. it was my put in was the first time I got fully green. And, um, for those of you who don't know what that put in is. Yeah. Tell us. It is when somebody is getting new and they're in the, sh they have to get, you know, run the show so they know what they're doing. So even in the ensemble, you have what they call a put in and everyone else is in street clothes. It's like a rehearsal, but you run the whole show with automation and lights and sound. So everybody else shows up in their street clothes and you are in full costume. So especially at, at, in Wicked, it's you feel crazy because you're like in like, you know, green attire with like, you know, a, like a crazy wig and everyone else is like normal looking. Um, yeah. Obviously in waitress land, it wasn't so crazy feeling. Um, so, yeah, we we did my put in 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 um, Detroit, Michigan. Sure. Where? I'm from Detroit. Uh, there may be Fox Theater. No, where do you usually probably come through the Fisher, I bet. Oh, no. Oh, you come did. through the Detroit Opera House. Oh, it was the Opera. Fox. Opera. It is the Opera House. Yeah, Detroit Opera House. That's where Wicked always comes. It's neat. Yep. It's a Needlander house. Yep. My put in was, um, and I remember being so nervous, but like looking at myself, like could not believe that this was like happening because this was such a dream for me. Um, and I remember like good friends of mine who I went to college with at AMDA, they were like, well, what are you going to do now? You achieved what you wanted, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, I I had that put in, and I remember just being so nervous, and of course feeling um, like I had so many questions. So thankfully, what we call this, you know, green girl club, and everyone's really mm -hmm. supportive of each other. And so I remember talking to um, at the time Meredith K. Clark was our um, standby. Yeah, and I remember being like, "How do you do this?" I mean, I remember feeling like there was like a desert in my throat when I was on like up in the air with all the smoke and the lights and it's hot and I'm just trying to like belt for, you know, my life. And yeah. I was like, so like, <sighs> and so she just kind of gave tricks to the train and things. And then um, my very first time on, I knew about, so my whole family was able to fly out to oh. Edinburgh, Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, a gem of a city. Yes, and I had my first time on. I don't remember it. I was I pretty much blacked out. Um, but there's pictures, yeah. so that's exciting. Great. Uh, and um, and then how long were off and on? How long were you in Wicked in all the capacities? Broadway tour, everything. Like six, seven years. Crazy. Yeah, I did the tour first, national first for um, about a year and a half, I would say. Uh -huh. Um, and then they brought me to the Broadway company and then they brought me back on to the second national for standby and then yeah. I'm off and then they would call and have you fill in, you know, and then it'd be, sure. off. then I went back on the first national. It was just like a journey of journeys. That was such a gift that kept on giving. Um, and, and, was, and Broadway debut, having done the tour, being moved to the Broadway company, you're doing your same track of ensemble yeah. cover Alphaba. But it's different. <laughs> well, of course, they're like, well, on the tour, it's left, but here it's right. And yes. to the side. you're like, great. Like I was on the complete opposite side of the stage <laughs> um, and had different costumes. Oh, Which yeah. that really exciting because after a year and a half, you start to feel like, 
you know, it was nice to like, be like, oh, I'm doing like a whole new journey and track here. So um, it was actually, right. really cool. and I love to like be in different costumes and some I loved and some I loved better on the other one, you know? Yeah. Uh, first night at the Gershwin. Uh, do you remember it? Broadway debut? Yeah, I do. Tell me everything. So I play um, that theater, like 1800 seats, epicness. Yeah, well, I will tell you this. It's harder. Broadway is harder because everyone goes home, right? Everyone has a life. Yeah. Everyone has some. And, and with Wicked, you know, there was a lot of, well, um, a little older. So they go home to their families and they have kids. And, you know, um, so, and the road, you have to become an instant family. So it's, su yeah. and you're always together. It's such like, a, you know, you travel and you live. It's like, so that's all I knew. So coming to the New York company was very hard at first for me because, I was just like, oh, you know, everyone was really nice, but yeah. then goes home, right? And they just, right. and then they come to work and then they go home. So that was a weird adjustment for me. I was 23, you know, and so I, um, and now I'm still like friends with that. When I was there, those are like my staple people and I still talk to all the time. Yeah. Um, and, but I remember my probably debut and it was like my whole family was there again, yeah, thankfully. And um, I kept it together. I really wanted to be like freaking out, but obviously I also wanted to like totally impress everybody and be like, I'm cool, I can hang, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I remember that curtain comes down, you know, um, after the show and I just stood there and I remember just feeling like frozen and being like, I can't believe that happened. But I still kept my cool. I got changed and everyone was like, you know, congrats, Torrance, you know, and then they leave, right? Everyone goes home. I got the stage door and like my whole family's there. It was so exciting. Still hasn't really hit me yet. I still was like, you know, the wall was up. And then I remember we got to the corner of uh, Ace. Yeah. I just looked back and I just, woof, like it just all of a sudden came over me and I cried. And of course, my mother was like, what's the matter? Um, and I was like, I did it, you know, um, but it was pretty uh, incredible. Yeah, it was. I'm incredible. in love with that. Yeah, it's a it's a great as an actor. It's like one of those moments you just never forget. Yeah. Um, Mary has a question. She says, during those years as Elphaba, were you able to do other shows? What were you doing while not being called on? So what is that life when it's like, hey, come back for two weeks? Are you constantly auditioning for other things? Are you doing other small regional gigs? What is that whole life like for those for popping in and out? Yeah, um, I was very lucky. I was able to do some regional theater. Um, and I those were some of my favorite memories. And um, I got to do uh, shows in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Um, I did shows in Indianapolis. Um, and I had the best time and I got to do, you know, some regional theater and um, also just feeling when I took that time, I mostly just did it to like be, you know, a little normal and have normality of seeing my family because what people don't realize is that we do eight shows a week with one day off. And it's that one day off you are exhausted. And also you have to do like real things like laundry and, and, you know, the grocery shop. So, and you miss a lot of family stuff, um, like mm -hmm. the holidays. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's prime time in New York. So we'd always be working on Christmas and Thanksgiving. So um, I just- Yeah, the irony of this time around is that <laughs> now when we would have time to do that, the world's like, don't do that. You're but, endangering everyone. Don't do that. You're like, well, no, 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 no. I never get to do this. So you're like, oh, my, my mother said to me, she's like, of course, when you actually were able to be around like for even a week, she's like, of course we can't be together. And I was like, I know, but you know what, next, next year, it'll be great. It'll be great. Yeah. It's going to be great. Um, but yeah, that's what I did. And, um, uh, between stuff and then they'd call and if I was available, I'd do it. And if I was doing like a regional thing, unfortunately I would be like, Oh, I can't, but please like, don't, you know, hesitate. Right. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So then where on the heels of all that does waitress come into your life? Cause you were in it from the beginning. Were you in it? Were there labs that you were part of in the very beginning? Where did you come in? Tell us everything. Let's talk waitress. Sure. Um, so C cliff notes is I actually, when I went back on the first national to help close it out for wicked, I ended up getting a vocal injury. Okay. And so I had to, when we were in LA and so for me, 
I was like, if I need to, if I can't do this, any, like if I need to like heal and maybe have surgery, who knows? I didn't have to, thankfully, but I was like, I want to be home. I want to go to my guy, you know? So I went yeah. back to work and, um, and so can I'm, we talk nuts and bolts of that? Uh, was it, uh, was it from the show? Was it from the lifestyle, the changing of temper? It, was it everything? Yeah. There's no like, and that even like an ENT will tell you there's no method to the madness. Right. And right. even like the best, most healthiest singers it could happen to. It's oh, it's you know, like you're an athlete. It's like, it, it's like gymnast. No one's like, Oh, I can't believe they got hurt. You're like, well, of course they got hurt. It's when you can see the physical ailments that people like can go, well, it's all part of the job. But for us, it's like this, like half an inch of life that's right here that you can't see and you don't know. And they're guessing, yeah. Oh, it's like the, and the, and the mental of that, all of that is so I love that you talk about it. I love that you're like, this is what happened. This is part, I mean, because it's, it's yeah. the part of it. And I remember like feeling really shameful at first and, and embarrassed. So yeah. I was very uncomfortable ever talking about it. And then I remember, um, Teal Wicks, I ran into her after when I was in recovery in New York and she, and I was telling her what was happening. She was like, Oh, it happens to us all. Right. Uh -huh. And it's it's such a normality that no one talks about because it feels like you are doing something wrong, like you did something wrong. But yeah. in fact, it wasn't. And so it was a really hard time for me um, because I was like sad. I was like, what if I yeah. can't sing anymore? Um, but well, yeah, and it, it's your whole life. You know, for me, I had a vocal injury a year and a half ago. And I've never, this is the first time I've ever told anyone in public because I still, I'm like, well, it's my life. All I do is talk. And it was the stress of opening a gift shop and talking every single day. And uh, it was, and at the worst acid reflux, which is now in control. Yeah. And it, you know, I went, you go to the ENT and she's like, oh, here, you just have like a little polyp on your cords. And you're like, I'm sorry, what did you say? Exactly. Full, full panic. And she, yeah. yeah. And I, I walked out of the doctor's office on the east side of Park Avenue, a grown man just crying, called my mom and was like, I'll never work again. This is it. Yeah. I'm about to open this gift shop. I can't talk. I'll have to, they'll slice my cords open. I will be the next Julie Andrews. And she was like, I think it's probably going to be okay. Um, let's relax. And, yeah. and sure enough, I went in, they lasered it off in 10 minutes and they were like, yeah, just don't talk for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Exactly. And then it was, you know, two months of the most worst mental recovery and fear and you know, you're like, all I do is talk and sing for a living. How will this ever end well? And then two months later, you're like, wow, oh, exactly. Go back. Weird. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, okay. So someone has a question while we're talking about vocal health. I love this. Um, do you have any tips? Uh, this person, Mary, um, who I don't, I don't think we know. Welcome, Mary. Uh, she went through vocal injury. What are you doing now to avoid or be careful? Have, has on the other side of this, especially going into a show like Waitress, is there different navigation of doing eight shows a week and these big epic roles? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think, you know, Mary, it's, it's about just being in touch and in tune with your body. Right. And I, you know, I know those times when I'm maybe yelling, you know, or like when you're in a group of people or when there's music playing and you're talking over it and also you're like, Oh, um, and so it's just being aware. And obviously for a singer, it's a lot of, um, water and tea and it sounds so crazy and ste like hot steaming right so it's just keeping all of that um you know open uh yeah but, uh yeah i had to relearn how to sing properly um yep. and so it was a long journey for me of like because here i am thinking i already know how to do all those things right so it's how to yeah. read all those things in a healthy way so um, learning tricks and all that. And then when I was in that vocal injury recovery was when all the waitress auditions were happening. And I remember being so devastated because I loved Cerebrellas from the get go of life. But I also was like, oh, this is like a show I would be perfectly right for. Yeah. I was just like, well, oh, well. And then I remember it was when I was on the recovery end and it was, I get an audition and they are still looking for Jesse Mueller's understudy for the out of town. And they are gonna bring you in. And I was like, <gasps> and at this point they've had rounds and rounds already. So I was like, well, they're really looking, oh man, the universe is like, yeah, Ooh. right. Um, and so, yeah, that was. And so you go in and is it a pretty quick, uh, we like her, this is great, check the box, we're done. One, 
it's a one audition day for me, but it yeah. does not work like that. So people don't know that it's like, it was, <laughs> yeah. um, I went in the right. for casting and the music director, and then they asked me to come back in the afternoon for Diane Paulus, Sarah Bareilles, Jesse Nelson couldn't be there, but they were filming it to send. Um, okay. And so when I came back, it was just a full room of icons. And I was just like, oh, oh God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> so then you kill it. She used to be mine. You go to ART. ART is where it was, right? Out of town. Um, and then it goes well. You, It's a hit. Uh, you're like, this will run forever. Or you're like, what is all this going to be? Who knows? Is this your yeah. first time being involved from the ground <laughs> Yeah, we knew, we knew, we knew it was special. We knew we loved it. Every, every ounce of it was done with such love and grace and, yeah. um, and building it was amazing. So when they asked me to move to the Broadway company with the show, I was of course just beyond ecstatic and, um, yeah. And then when we were in rehearsals right away, of course, it was like the time when also Hamilton was opening on Broadway. So, you know, people were like, you know, the political side of the business is like, oh, do we wait, you know, so that way if we don't get like washed under the radar, you know, and, and yeah. I felt so good about our little, our little home slice. And so we, and we were like, no, they're just so different, you know? And so yeah. we, they pushed and went and we went with the ride and thankfully people came and loved it. And we ran, and even Sarah would say it, we ran even longer than we could have loved and imagined. And yeah. And, uh, it was bittersweet, of course, to close it, but it felt right, you know, and it felt like the time of um, leaving on a high instead of yeah. feeling like no one's showing up and liking it anymore. And so it has to. Yeah, be which is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is never. A, it's not yeah. a great feeling. Um, I remember. Uh, well, one, I remember you saying you booked this and I thought this is cr oh crazy. OK, this is good. OK. And then I remember you in tech, we were at Glasshouse Tavern, Steel Trap, and you walked in, you were in tech, and you were like, nothing fits. <laughs> the Brooks Atkins stage is too small, and none of the beds are, the, the hospital bed isn't fitting on or something, and you're like, it'll never fit, it'll never work, this theater's too small, the whole show, we're closing tomorrow. And I was like, I think you're probably not closing tomorrow. Um, so you haven't even opened yet. It's still tech. Right. Uh, but I remember this moment of like, oh, it's a mess. It'll never work. And then I think I ran into you on the street like a year later. I was like, it's so it worked. And they fit the bed, finally fit. And <laughs> it's crazy. It's working. <laughs> it's um, working. Yeah, no, it's so crazy because also, you know, for me, the only other Broadway comparison of theaters is the Gershwin, which is massive. So when yeah. I got to the Brooks, I was like, there's going to be a musical in this space. Um, so, but this, our crew there, uh, I love those guys so much. And everything, they figured it out. Everything was in the air, in the wings. So, I mean, the hospital bed, the bathroom, um, everything was literally hey. coming down when something needs to go and then it'd have to go right back up. Um, and we were never allowed to be in the wings if it wasn't, we had, you know, because there was legit no space. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. And then what is it like to cover Jesse Mueller, who I think is an icon? What is it like to then stay with the show until the end? Excuse me, four years with all the different Jennas that came in. And then on the heels of that, um, someone threw in a question that ties into all of that as if I haven't loaded you up with enough. What was your favorite moment as Jenna? And then did it differ when you worked with different casts of people who came in, understudy people, a different Jenna comes in, does the vibe of the cast change because it's such a small show? Talk to us all about that Jenna life with all the difference. Yeah. Um, well, okay, I'll answer Beth Marie first. So, yeah. moment as Jenna. Oof. Um, you know, I have, uh, I feel like I have so many, but I think the most prominent thing that stands out for me and what is like the coolest was, of course, my debut, which was also a moment of blackout. So I probably can't really give too much about that. Um, <laughs> sure. but, my, but my family was able to be there and all those moments are very special to me when, when I'm able to do that. Though yeah. I will say, when my family's out there, I feel more nervous than if it's a bunch of strangers, I don't know. Um, 
but and those are the people who would love it if I bombed. I know, but it's like, yeah, it's the when you know <laughs> people out there did terrible, they'd be like, yeah. correct. Um, but one of the coolest moments. So during the end of the run, I um, I started to work, teach at AMDA. So I went back and I became a musical theater teacher at AMDA. And I only had one one class because I was at the show. So I had to double, you know, juggle. Yeah. Um, and I was able to have two shows on towards the end of our closing. And so my whole entire class came to oh. my second to last Jenna performance. And it was the most liberating, like exciting. And it felt like it was so, it was really awesome. And it was probably one of my favorite memories. And everyone of course was like, that audience was one of the best is a bunch of like 18 year olds just yelling constantly you know oh um, my gosh i think that was my favorite moments um for jenna and, and what a life-changing thing for them as students who one are in your exact same shoes circa a decade before you know that that moment but then also to see someone who's in class going like do better do this you know, maybe think of it like this. This is how I approach it. Oh, I got to leave class. And then 8 p.m. you are putting on your apron and these kids are watching you teach what you have taught in the classroom hours before 10 blocks north. Now you are 10 blocks south of them on a Broadway stage yeah. going like this is how you do it. Yeah. I mean, what a wild. That's yeah. the thing I think I loved about AMDA was there was the immediacy of a lot of the teachers. Of course, there were some that had been there forever and had been out of the game. Right. But. There was a lot that were like of dance teachers specifically that were like, well, no, you would never wear that. This is how the business is going. And then I'll see you at an audition in an hour, right. which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Constant, you know, that, that working and knowing what's happening and, um, yeah, but yeah that's, that's wild. my favorite memories. Wow. Besides the debut. Um, and then what is it like to, with all the different Jenna's coming in, did the vibe change? Did you have to change things uh, of how you approach the role based on how others did it? Tell me everything. Um, so basically um, covering Jesse Mueller was like watching a masterclass. Uh, and, you know, and I think she is just a class act with um, the business. Uh, yeah. And so when I first went on, of course, I just kept thinking, oh, they want the, her version, right? They want her, her Jenna. And so I kind of was like doing my version of her version, right? Um, yeah. and thankfully, the creative team was so involved and they came and saw me on and they were like, let's chat. We want you. We want your Jenna. And so I was like, really? So they were awesome and let me be mine. And mine was completely different than Jesse's and it's completely different than Kat and Nicolette's and Shoshana and the list goes on. And the best part about it is they allowed all of us uh, uh, women to come in and, and do our version. And so when people came to our show, which is why I think it also ran so long is that you never saw the same show because yeah. we all were very different in what we brought to the role and how we, our Jenna, you know, which what? is the polar opposite of Wicked, right? Because Wicked is a blockbuster. Whether you see it in Denmark or you see it in London, they want you to see that same pinky raised during No Good Deed. Yeah. So it is your police down to the thumb, the black thumbnail. So do you, what, what is the difference? I mean, obviously the producing entity of it feeling the same and there, that's a vision for Wicked. So there's obviously that difference. But do you think that there's because a lot of shows they want you to try to do exactly what the person's doing eight times a week and not get in anyone's way. There's very little artistic freedom in an understudy situation. So is it a female creative team and a powerful female role? Do you think, I mean, what is Sarah Bareilles who doesn't do a lot of musical theater? Where, where is, where do you think the difference lies? Yeah, I don't, I don't actually know that answer, you know, but I do believe with, this team of, of all women and female is just that they, in the show about, you know, female empowerment, um, they wanted us to kind of just be able to honestly portray that as much as possible and not feel so showy, right? Yeah. Um, so for that, it would be being ourselves, you know, in a, in a sense, right? Because like for me, yeah. I'm a very, I'm a tough, <laughs> tough New Yorker, right? So there were parts of Jenna that were sassy and they were like, you know, 
but they still had to be in the world of this person, right? Sure. So finding that balance, even for myself, where it gets like, oh, there's Stephanie instead of there's Jenna, right? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and, and it did change with who came in, but never in a bad way. It just, you know, every one of us is a different person and a different energy, um, you know, and some need the closed door focus before the show. And then some people have that door open and music playing and you can come in, right? Um, yeah. But always, always, and I will say this, what a lucky group we were. Every person that, and I can say this because I was there from start to finish. <laughs> person that came into our cast, male or female, they hired the kindest, most supportive group of people. It was never a toxic environment. It never felt, oh, well, that's different, right? Right. It was just constantly like, yeah, I'm here for that, right? It never yeah. felt like, what is this person doing? It just felt great. I love that, you know, and a yeah. very, very supportive. We, you know, we, we say it's a little family and it was, it was very much a very small family that we had. Yeah. And then in a character, I love that in a character that's literally trying to find her voice, uh, both metaphorically and literally do you, and with Sarah Brillis being such a, you know, she has a, such a distinct style and her music, even this being musical theater version of it really lives in that pocket. Were you able to find your own vocal stylings of what that is? Or was even the vocal track like, you know, character wise, you we have a little more freedom, but vocally, Sarah really wants you to do this and this and or what? I mean, yes, a little bit, but not really. I mean, because um, all of us have different sounds anyway, but... For the most part, she did not want a musical theater sound. It was a yeah. pop driven, you know, folky kind of situation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the, the tone quality of the show is more of where she wanted to make sure that happened and not sound very like, ah, right? Yeah, <laughs> correct. So, um, that was probably it. But other than that, she was like, freedom, go ahead. Boom. And then she used to be mine. It, hard, epic, hard to sing. Is it, uh, it, no. or by that point, you're like ready and let's yeah, go. That song was like always like, even if I felt like garbage. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, it was the one song that I felt like, okay, I can get through this song, which is crazy. I know. For me, what Bacon can do. Was yeah. <laughs> one where I was like, why? Why? <laughs> That end, especially that one note where you're like, why would you do that to any woman? Yeah, exactly. And then she has like this great, cause she's a, a unicorn and she's writing and she has no range. She's like, her range is like endless, but like bottom to top. And so she's yeah. like, everyone can sing this. And we're like, <laughs> you're like, maybe once I could squeak it out. <laughs> I'm lucky. Yeah. Um, okay, here, let's talk about the real hard-hitting questions. This is Tom, who we love. Hi, Stephanie. After seeing you perform door number two at the Alpha Ball in 2018, I had hoped I would get to see you play Jenna, but never did. Sad face. But as a former Jenna, what is your favorite kind of pie? Hard-hitting questions. Mm, that is really hard. Um, I would probably lean towards something that would be like, like a chocolatey, peanut buttery situation, you know? Sure. Or a pumpkin. I do love a pumpkin pie. All right. Um, I know, I feel like it's going to be so devastating to tell everybody, but I'm not really a sweets person. You give me like a cheeseburger and fries, I am thrilled. <laughs> but I think you're like, uh, I'll, I have, I'll have a bite. Sure. Um, but yeah. Sure. Um, staying on the pies um, with the best user handle I've ever heard in my life. Another poop joke says, how long did it take to master assembling a pie on stage? Talk to us about that. Really great thing. As I just said, I'm not a sweets person, so I don't, I've never baked a pie or in my entire life, you know, it's like a, oh, I got cookies and it's like scoop and plop, right? <laughs> um, so uh, my very first time on, I never touched any of the props yet. Um, great. <laughs> early in the run. So well, I did not have a put in yet. And we learned about the puddings. 
So I never touched any of that yet. So it was really, uh, it was interesting. And I will tell you during You Matter to Me, you know, she's supposed to be like this epic baker and pie extraordinaire. And so they have this dough and I'm supposed to be like rolling it and it gets beautiful. And then I'm supposed to like place it into the, you know, baking thing that Dr. Pomodoro gives, baking thing, you like that? Um, <laughs> high 10, I'm learning. Um, so uh, yeah, so my first time I never rolled it. So I'm like, it's not going well. And I'm not joking you, like the dough, right? It was like the, the ball when it started. And then it got to maybe flattened out to like, Okay, it's like this big, right? Not, does not stretch at all. And I still just panicked instead of like being a good actor and just not putting it in the, you know, the tin. I was like, Ugh. I put it in, the tin. doesn't even touch the sides at all. Like it's still like, and a, a ball, I right? Just feel Drew's energy. And I just kind of look and he's like this. Oh no. And I looked and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll kill you. Do not laugh. Do not laugh dying inside but then at the end honestly people would be like it's really good i was like thank you still have a it i just didn't do that though wow wow <laughs> this is um caitlin she says just flower everywhere legit <laughs> just... flower everywhere and on the okay. floor like god help you if you wipe out oh gosh um, okay, uh, I have two uh, last thoughts for you. Uh, Brooks Atkinson, because that's a theater we spent our time at all week, is there a world where there's a specific memory you have about the building uh, other than the set doesn't fit? <laughs> um, I love that theater so much. Um, it's so intimate and it's, um, what I love about all these theaters is that they keep the the staff, right? So the front of house is always the same. The crew, you know, for the most part is always the same, depending on how big the size of the vehicle or show is. So they bring more, you know, people yep. on. Um, but it always felt like such a home. Like it felt like my second home. And, you know, I go to my apartment and I think I spent more time in that theater than actually my own apartment. Yeah. And you become a family and it's just such a it always felt like a safe haven um and that you know and i'll never forget uh i went and saw six which is now in there um yeah. right before the shutdown and it was the strangest feeling to not go through the stage door right and to go like through the line with everyone else um but one of the best things was we when i got to the section of where you're going to get handed your playbill by the lovely staff, they freaked out. Oh. They so happy to see me. It was like this like family moment, you know? And so it, it was like really special. And I think that place will always have a special, special place in my heart forever. I'm talking even the, 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 the ticket sales, the, you know, in the front, the box office people who I yeah. just, it, it was just this big family and they are constant and they will be there and they're going to be there when uh, things open up again and yeah. I'm able to just stop by to say hello. And that feels pretty awesome. You know, that's incredible. And then right before uh, March 12th. So I saw you taught a class for us right before, I mean, like yes. days before I had, I, I was like, Oh, great. Yeah. I wonder how this will go. How's your new show going? So tell us about the show you were doing as our lives fell apart on March 12th. So it's about to be in a show at the public theater um, called The Visitor. It's based, it's on, um, yet again, off of a movie. Um, so uh, yeah, you, funny thing is my, they were in rehearsals. I was going to be a swing. The okay. first day of my rehearsal was shut down. Oh no, I don't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They were like, ladies, I was, I introduced you into the room. I was like, ladies and gentlemen, joining the cast is Stephanie Torrance. And they were like, we're closing. Great. Literally. So, um, yeah, that was you know. great. Yeah. And, and has there been any, of course, who knows anything? Do we think on the other side of this, it'll all, they'll plug it back in and away we'll go. I hope so. And I think that they hope so. Um, I yeah. A really um, important message too that I think needs to be heard, and so I think that that will be the the end. Oh. Goal. 
And how you been doing through all of this? Uh, you know, you're back teaching at AMDA a little bit. Is that right? Yes, I am. And not a little bit, a lot of it. This is oh, like, good. This is, you know, um, I just dove right in. But I mean, um, keeping busy, uh, good. And, you know, and staying safe and um, good. Uh, yeah, teaching at AMDA and doing more classes than I ever have. So I feel at times I, I teachers have a new I already thought they were the coolest people ever, but they have a new level of respect from me because it's, it's, it's a lot of work and yep. I am somebody who takes on every person and, and, and cares probably way too much. Um, so for me, it's like the hours that I put in after it, sometimes I'm working <clears throat> for school till like 11 o'clock at night. Yep. Um, and yeah, so, the prep for the next class. I mean, the, the end of prep that no one ever sees. Yeah. And, and just really thinking about each kid and trying to help them in what they need and what they're, what's going to give them the tools to go forward. Cause everyone is different. Right. And everyone in my classes are different. You can't compare them. So, yeah. uh, you know, finding what's right for each individual student and really trying to help them grow. And it's just, um, it's a lot of the behind the scene work. That's how we know you're a great teacher. Uh, I can already <laughs> tell. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's, I mean, you'll change those kids lives. You yeah. know, they'll, they'll be lucky and, and the amount that they're paying, you know, that's where the payoff is, is the people who are in front of you with their clipboard that they've taken way copious amounts of notes. And that's you. Um, yeah, it's it's fun to watch. It's it's been fun to watch you now and knowing you a couple of years, well, many years. It's been fun to watch you kind of navigate all the different facets of, you know, all the years of Wicked and what that does, and then you know injuries and this and uh, you know it's um, I don't know. You're resilient. You're smart. You're obviously talented. There's an underlying layer of talent that the. Um, so it's been fun. It's been fun to watch you, you know, and I always love walking, usually running straight into you uh, on a tour, um, usually on the way to the Brooks Atkinson, you know, or, or post all of that. So uh, I look forward to our run-ins uh, yeah. again. The last time I ran into you, I think your fam, you were with your parents too. So that was um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, remember family? Remember when we were with your families? <laughs> <laughs> remember parents? I kind of do. I kind of remember what they look like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, crazy. Um, how should we, if people want to follow you, is Instagram the best way? Instagram is the best way. I, 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 I'm I, on the Twitter land, but I don't really tweet that much. So that is, Instagram is is the, is where Great. I'm at. Yeah. Okay, good. Tornzy, 18. That's where we should go follow you. And we will go follow her. She's a dream. She's wonderful. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you're wonderful. Thank you for spending a little piece of your Saturday with us. Um, I can't wait till we're back to normal on the other side of this. Keep keep staying, keep busy, keep, uh, you know, inspiring those those kids. Gosh, they're lucky to have you. And you too. I think you are such an inspiration and just hardworking. And you are, um, everyone in this virtual land is so lucky to have you. Keep, keep You're very it. nice. Love. Yeah. Thank you. One day closer. Your dream. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you. Uh, good luck. Uh, happy holidays and happy new year. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Duh, bye, my love. Um, she is, um, well, yeah, you can see why she, uh, people want to work with her. The ta I, When I say the talent is there, it uh, it's, a, it's a crazy instrument. It's a crazy voice. And I think touching on like the, the stuff that we don't talk a lot about, which is the industry, uh, the industry is the injuries. Um, Sorry, I'm distracted because my French Bulldog mascot has decided that he's up. Oh, he thought I was finished. I'm not finished. And so now he's back to sleeping. And now he's going to pretend to sleep until we're really done. Um, talking about vocal injuries, you you know, it's hard to navigate all that, especially when someone's so talented and you have great technique. But some of these shows, you know, in, in my life, so much talking. So all I do is talk. <laughs> you, when you have to navigate all of that as an artist, as a human, as a performer. So it's a... Uh, it's a great thing to touch on and and throw into the mix of everything else that we talk about. So I'm glad we we were able to throw that in. Um, thank you for joining as you always do uh, every Saturday. It makes my heart so happy. Yeah, I hope you all had a great uh, Christmas if you do celebrate. 
we're wrapping up our Broadway paper crane project, which is sending in paper cranes to Times Square. Um, we're collecting all of our cranes. We hit our thousand mark. I think we're at like 1200 something. And so we're wrapping that up. I'm putting the entire display together, which will launch at our gift shop uh, when we reopen this late spring. I'm thinking May, June. I don't know yet, but um, we're navigating all that with vaccines and all of this. And so we're going to wrap that up. Um, I'm engraving every name of uh, someone who sends one in on our uh, Times Square Ball of Fame. And so I have to give a deadline to uh, to add your name to the list. So if you haven't sent one in, um, send one of those. Uh, you can email me or find us on social media if you need the address uh, because it's long since been posted about uh, months ago. Uh, but send those in, a little bit of hope um, uh, and love for our Broadway world and our theater world. And here we are. Uh, as I always say, uh, one day closer to Broadway, you guys are all a dream. Um, if you want to uh, interact with us a little more, if you don't already, uh, of course, at Broadway Up Close is the easiest way. You're here on Facebook, so you can give us a like and get all of our information there. We have our entire gift shop uh, online, um, www.broadwayupclose.com forward slash souvenirs. Anything that's sold out will be restocked by mid-January. That's the goal of my life now. If you wipe me out uh, for holiday day sales, which makes me so happy. Uh, uh, but now I got to go refill everything. So soon enough, anything that is sold out will be in uh, back in stock, including marquee ornaments. And then should you want $5 off, uh, Broadway 5 is your discount code to get $5 off for any of that. You guys uh, are a dream. A dream. Uh, Monday, we go into week 29, which is crazy. We are almost into the 30s, which means the end is in sight, which I can't even wrap my mind around. Um, but in the meantime, um, Happy New Year. Uh, by the time I see you next week, I believe it'll be 2021. I'll almost be 36 years old. My birthday is January 4th, so we'll celebrate that or something. I don't know. Uh, but you guys are wonderful. One day closer to Broadway. I love you all. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. And stay safe and sane. And um, I'll see you next week.